BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. All right, hello everybody. Today is Saturday, and it is a Saturday night. And on the weekends, I've been doing a regular segment about the death of Jean Benet Ramsey from back in 1996. And I will offer one update for the channel. I do a regular segment every Wednesday that has been somewhat of a revolving topic. I've done the Long Island serial killer, the Phantom Killer, the New Orleans Axe Man. And I was, well, I stated in a previous episode that I was going to move this Saturday segment to Wednesday, and every Wednesday I would do an episode about Jean Bonnet. But that is not going to be the case. The Jean Bonnet episodes are going to keep coming out on the weekends, and there are several books that I would like to go through in a particular order, um, purely based on my own curiosity about the death of Jean Bonnet Ramsey. And on the Wednesday show, it's actually going to be devoted to Jack the Ripper. And of course, every Monday is Zodiac Monday here on Black Box Online Radio. I'll be doing the new Ripper segment. And I wanted to do that for a particular reason, to keep Friday open and anything goes Friday, where any subject is fair game. Because I'm also somebody who just follows true crime cases because I'm very curious. And I just want to respond to them. I want to share observations that I make about the material that's out there. Do you ever just watch a true crime documentary and you're like, hey, wait a second, what about this? And that's what turns into a Black Box Online radio episode. There's nothing amazingly scholarly about it, just human curiosity, more or less. But the namesake from this episode comes from a series that I've been doing where I was reading the book Presumed Guilty by Stephen Singular, and I wanted to do a Q&A session for two reasons. Firstly, you guys were leaving some amazing comments about Jean Benet Ramsey's case and very insightful statements, and I wanted to respond to them. And the second reason was that I am so unbelievably frustrated with Stephen Singular's book Presumed Guilty because... My initial understanding of it was that he was trying to go for an overlooked theory, and that is that Jean Benet Ramsey, the child beauty queen, the girl who has been frozen in time, was murdered in 1996 because there was a sex ring operating in Colorado, and that her death was a casualty of their abuse. And I think that He's going to tie it in some way, somehow, to the fact that John and Patsy Ramsey knew who was responsible. However, they chose not to act simply out of fear. They chose not to respond simply out of fear. That's stuff that I've heard him talk about in interviews, particularly on the show Porkins Policy Radio. But in the book, it's like, I was venting my frustrations on Zodiac Monday, but I'll say it again. 170 pages into it, and he just hasn't made the case for that yet. He hasn't gotten to the point. And if you ever do read the book Presumed Guilty by Stephen Singular, you'll see that it's the story of somebody who was following the events as they happened, like a journalist or a reporter. On this day, he had this conversation with this person. On that day, he had that conversation with that person. And then there's some unrelated stories in there about other true crime cases, which are are very valuable for the true crime world and an understanding of the material, but he isn't connecting the dots. 
And in case you haven't heard some of the episodes from the book discussion, one point where I was extremely critical of this whole sex ring operating in Colorado theory tied to Jean Benet is that the girls who were found in the sex ring were tied up similarly to the way Jean Benet was. However, they had belts around their legs and scarves tied around their mouths. Jean Benet to the best of my knowledge, didn't have any belt tied around her legs, and absolutely she had duct tape over her mouth, not a scarf, so it appears to be a completely different criminal operation. But that's just my take on the subject, and from the first episode, I would like to get to a particular comment from Victoria Von Cartier, who says, Either the Ramsey housekeeper and her brood or a pedophile Nothing to do with an underground ring, blah, blah, blah. All those ridiculous conspiracy theories are so far-fetched. Well, I was pretty sure that I was going to go into Stephen Singular's book and disagree with this whole sex ring theory that Jean Benet Ramsey was not murdered by someone in the family or an intruder, but it's actually some type of active participant role with some type of pedophile ring in Colorado. I was pretty sure that I was going to disagree with it, but I would like to know the supporting points for and against, and I would like to know the reasons why I can articulate how that theory is incorrect. And he's just not getting to the point in the book, and it's a very frustrating read. But you want to hear something about a ridiculous conspiracy theory? Did you ever hear the one that Jean Benet Ramsey wasn't actually murdered, and that she actually grew up to be Katy Perry? And... One of the um, more ridiculous aspects of that is that they would match up certain photos of Katy Perry to Jean Benet Ramsey by placing Katy Perry's photo on top of it and saying, hey, it lines up. Well, of course it is, because you're taking a photo and you're using photos of the exact same size. And yeah, she has eyes and a nose and a mouth, and of course it's going to line up. Put any photo on top of another photo. Yeah, okay, if you got the dimensions right, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth match up. Absoluta nonsense. But as far as um, some other theories in the Jean Bonnet case, I would like to get to your comments here. And the next comment comes to us from Philly Throwback, who says, Good observation. I've recently been converted to a believer of the Burke did it theory. Patsy Ramsey wrote the ransom note to cover it up, and the 911 call to me does sound like it has Burke's voice and one of the parents asking him, What did you do? twice. Okay, Jean Benet Ramsey was murdered. She was struck on the top of the head with a blunt object. She was choked or strangled with what has been referred to as the garotte, which was made from a paintbrush in the Ramsey household. She had duct tape over her mouth, as previously stated. Her arms had been tied up, and the t- the ties actually went over her sweater, suggesting that she was not putting up any struggle and that she was actually unconscious at the time. And this is a theory that a lot of you guys in the comments section are really pointing to, that Jean Benet was not murdered by her father nor her mother, but was actually murdered by her older brother, Burke. And it became the focus of not only numerous internet discussions, but also the CBS documentary episode. And Burke Ramsey sued CBS for $750 million dollars because they did this TV special about him, accusing him of a crime that he was not charged with. And I actually just happened upon a YouTube video that was discussing that, and it was saying that Burke Ramsey could almost never have been able to collect on that $750 million lawsuit, because to win, he would have had to prove that CBS intentionally tried to destroy his reputation, that that was the sole focus of the TV special about how Burke Ramsey murdered his sister, but that would be nearly impossible to prove because the thesis of it isn't Burke Ramsey is a bad person and that we shouldn't like him. The thesis of it was that he should be the prime suspect in Jean Benet's murder or that he committed the crime, and it's more about getting answers to the questions and it's about getting the truth as opposed to simply trying to make him look bad. So I do agree with that. I mean, I don't see how they would ever be able to prove that that was the sole intention. But I'm not a lawyer, and from following other true crime cases and stories on YouTube, I have heard instances where 
people try to file the lawsuit because they say that people are posting intentionally misleading information and that um dealing with things like libel and slander so i um have some mixed feelings but believe it or not a lot of you will disagree with this but i think the 750 million dollar lawsuit actually leans toward burke's innocence and that's because again from just some being some guy who follows true crime on youtube it is my understanding that if somebody files a lawsuit that it goes into disclosure and during the process of disclosure both sides have to share everything and that people would actually be vetting Burke much more thoroughly and I'm sure he knew that and his attorney Lynn Wood knew that so then they would be a much closer focus on examination on Burke and if there was actually some way somehow that he would end up being convicted for it or if convicted of something then I don't think that that would have been the advice of his legal counsel but a lot of you guys are gonna dispute that in the comment section I mean there are numerous um, people including Chicken Happy who just simply says Burke did it leaning not only leaning that who has made up his mind saying that Burke Ramsey murdered his sister Jean Bonnet I also want to point out that there was another um, element to the comment from Philly Throwback that said that Patsy Ramsey should be the suspect for writing the ransom note and I have to confess, her handwriting looks very similar. When they actually do blow-ups and enlarged photos of Patsy Ramsey's handwriting versus the ransom note, I do notice a certain amount of differences, and I begin to think that it looks different. But I do confess, her handwriting looks very similar. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do a book discussion on the death of innocence, the book that was authored by John Ramsey and Patsy Ramsey, because... I want to know if we can read between the lines or to see if there's some type of clue that has been leaked out or some type of giveaway or a tell in which John or Patsy might actually share something that they shouldn't have. I'm very curious about that book and I do have a copy of it. And that will be the next book discussion here on this channel. And as always, you can like and subscribe. Follow along with all of these true crime discussions, and a great way to support all of these efforts is to go over to buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that in the description box. Buymeacoffee.com allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. So, one theory is that Berg Ramsey murdered his sister because of a fight over pineapple, that Berg had some violent tendencies, Maybe one time, well, not maybe one time, definitely one time, he got into a physical altercation with Jean Bonnet. I was referring to the incident where he hit her in the face with a golf club. The family says it's an accident, but other people disagree. They think that Burke lashed out in rage, and that Burke was eating pineapple in the kitchen, and that Jean Bonnet took a piece of his pineapple, and he got mad, and he started chasing her around, and he grabbed a blunt object, maybe a flashlight, and struck her on the top of the head. And she went unconscious. And then Burke Ramsey picked up a piece of his toy train set, the toy train track, and stabbed Jean Bonnet in the side just to see if he could get any signs of life out of her. And we have a comment from One Solved Mystery about that that says, While two of the prongs on Burke's train set pieces were close to the same distance as the marks on Jean Bonnet, Burke's train set pieces each had three prongs and none of them were missing their middle prong. And yes, the fruit vegetable-like material is found in Jean Bonnet's upper small intestine, which takes two to six hours to arrive there. So the Burke head bump theory just doesn't fly, in my humble opinion. Further, there was later found to be cherries and grapes in her intestinal tract, also indicating to me, at least, that she most likely ate some fruit salad, ambrosia, or fruitcake while she was at the White's Christmas party that evening. And I think that the more valuable element of this comment is looking at the train track set and talking about how if these prongs don't match up, then that could be a very big hindrance on any type of theory involving uh, Burke Ramsey as the perpetrator. And I've said very clearly to um, disagree with a lot of people in the comment section, I don't believe Burke Ramsey murdered his sister, and I do think he's been somewhat unfairly vilified. For, and the reasons why are because 
people don't like his behavior during the interrogation video, they didn't like his behavior during the Dr. Phil interview, and they also have put together somewhat of a comprehensible narrative. I mean, I can comprehend the narrative. Jean Benet is involved with all of these pageants, Burke is jealous, and all of the focus is on either Jean Benet or Patsy and John Ramsey, the parents, also have a certain amount of focus on them, and that Burke is more or less just left out of everything, he feels neglected, and there's a lot of resentment, and that all came out in a very terrible incident. But I just don't believe the physical evidence is there to suggest that Burke Ramsey murdered Jean Bonnet. Moving on to the next comment, this one is from Jack Sizzle, and this was actually shared on a couple different episodes about Jean Bonnet Ramsey here on this channel. Very logical and level-headed narrative on this podcast. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. And it's a good listen, but I do disagree with one thing, that this case is unsolved because of bad police work. Mistakes were certainly made, but this case is not unsolved 26 years later because those in positions of power won't allow it to be solved. The police tried solving it, and about half a dozen of them quit because of the corruption and politics and red tape that they were dealing with. And I'm the most anti-cop person ever. I respect detectives, but not all police officers. But I do think the police wanted to solve this. And do, and people have this perception that the police are all-powerful, which isn't true. They answer to a chief and a commander and a mayor above everyone else. So if they're told not to pursue a particular lead or being hamstrung by higher authorities, it ends there. And let's be real about Lou Smith. He was just a paid pie piper, bought and paid for by the DA and the Ramses, not to find the truth, but to push the intruder narrative. And mostly, I have accepted that Lou Smith, one of the investigators in the case, was a disinfo agent. And this came about because in one documentary, he said that Jean Benet wouldn't have died from the head wound, but uh, one person whom I was corresponding with, a follower of this program named Tina L., sent me the medical examiner's report that showed that it was in complete contradiction to the statements from Lou Smith that Jean Benet would have died from the head wound. However, she actually died from the strangulation in the garrot that was um that was administered by the garrot. But if that if she had just not been strangled at all, she would have passed away anyway. And this was com in complete contradiction to the comments that Lou Smith made in a documentary. So I am probably of the expectation, or I do expect that Lou Smith would have known that, and he was spreading bad information around. Now, on the other hand, and this is a very important on the other hand, Lou Smith showed how easy it would have been for somebody to enter the Ramsey household, how easy it would have been for an intruder to break in. And they're even talking about how Lou Smith in his 70s was able to go through a set of um, very easy maneuvers to break into the Ramsey's Colorado home without even leaving footprints in the snow. So no matter what, an intruder could have easily broken in and attacked Jean Bonnet. And one observation that I have never heard anyone else share is that it relates to Jean Bonnet's body after she passed away. As I said, she's tied up and bound, and she has these ties on her wrists. And they did a very big reconstruction of this in the film version of Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, where her body is found by John Ramsey, her father, as well as Fleet White. But John Ramsey picks her up, and he says, oh, she's so stiff, and rigor mortis had set in, and that her body is more or less stuck in that elongated position with her hands above her head. And one thing is that, was somebody trying to put Jean Bonnet's body in the suitcase in the basement that was nearby? And, uh, yeah, somebody in the comment section did point that out first. They thought that the person was trying to put Jean Bonnet's body in the suitcase, but then I added the additional layer, but her body became stuck in that um, post-mortem position, and then they were unable to. Like, they wanted to take Jean Bonnet's body out of the house, but then they decided that it was too risky because she couldn't fit in the suitcase, and that ties all into the ransom note because it's a ransom note. The ransom note that says, we're going to decapitate her, we're the foreign faction, 
John, use your common sense, give us $118,000, a two-and-a-half page ransom note was left. And one of the most puzzling aspects of the case is, why would somebody leave a ransom note if Jean Bonnet is dead in the basement? And the only thing that I could think of in the past was, number one, it was a diversion, or number two, what I just stated, that perhaps they actually wanted to go through with this kidnapping facade for a little bit more, maybe actually try to extract the money out of John Ramsey, but John Bonet couldn't fit in the suitcase, or she couldn't fit in whatever type of travel mechanism they had, or transporting mechanism that they had. They didn't have any practical way to transport the body, so they just scrapped the plan. Okay, let's get out of here, whether it's one person or two people or three people. But going back to the comment that was left by Jack Sizzle, and it says that after the um, people respond to a chief, a commander, and a mayor above everyone else, so if they're told not to pursue a particular lead or being hamstrung by higher authorities, it ends there. Lou Smith might have been a kind old man, but he was compromised, and people should understand that. And I'm very familiar with Stephen Singular's theory. I appreciate what he does, going down the hole that few go down, and exposing horrible shit, but I disagree with him on various fundamental things. He, th he seems to think that the murder was an accident. A sexually assaulted six-year-old girl was then choked out for sexual gratification with a head blow to finish her off. He thinks it's an accident, and... To be very clear, the strangulation is what killed Jean Bonnet, not the head wound, but the head wound should have, if it were not, um, if there had not been other uh, components to the murder. And he seems to think that John or Patsy Ramsey could have done the crime because there's no pathology there, which is crazy. Absolutely, that is crazy, that there's no pathology, that the parents wouldn't have murdered their child. The problems that I have with accusing John or Patsy Ramsey of murdering their daughter is that the cover-up. I mean, what, somebody got hit on the head too hard, and that her own parents didn't completely make sure that she was dead? I mean, they, they there were signs of life. I mean, that I still just cannot fathom that... John or Patsy would have actually strangled Jean Bonnet as part of murder staging, as part of staging the scene to try and make it look like something else. If she hadn't actually passed away yet, I can't conceive of it. But the whole concept of parents never murder their children, no, absolutely not. Yes, parents can murder their children, and you can find episodes of Black Box Online Radio talking about that. You can go through some of the episodes that I did on Darlie Rudier, for example. That's just the one that came to mind, the woman from Texas who murdered her two sons. But also, there's a big difference between a parent murdering their child and a parent trying to stage the scene to make it look like something else and in the process, killing their child. So this whole thing about, oh yeah, well, Jean Bonnet got hit in the head by Burke, and John Ramsey made the garrote, or he improved the garrote, and then he strangled Jean Bonnet with it, thinking that she was dead. I mean, that just, to me, even if you don't like John Ramsey, I just think that that is so far-fetched that it just most likely did not happen. And back to the comment. I think an author would be smart enough to realize there doesn't have to be a pattern of behavior for a sexual crime or murder to take place. I agree as well. And he seems to almost give them a pass. With that said, I will entertain the possibility that a pile of shit might have been left on their doorstep and then proceeded to cover it up for whatever reason. Okay, something about how there's this sex ring that is operating and that it is targeting children like Jean Bonnet. And why would why would Jean John Ramsey or Patsy Ramsey not do anything if their daughter were murdered by a member of a sex ring because it was from it was committed by a high-ranking member of Lockheed Martin someone of not only the business elites but the global elites one of those evil murdering globalists that Alex Jones likes to talk about that they were involved with some type of ritualistic sexual abuse and before you think that that sounds extremely crazy Let's remove all the buzzwords, because it was a high-ranking business elite official who um, 
had some involvement with the murder, and that's why John and Patsy Ramsey didn't do anything, because, or they didn't uh, respond in what people would think would be a normal way, because they were just absolutely terrified and felt powerless in face of someone who was indeed more powerful than them. And I'm going to add the disclaimer, I do not endorse that particular theory. I'm just, these are just fragments of some things that have been shared online. But again, I don't think Patsy did it or Burke did it. This is back to the comment. But again, I don't think Patsy did it or Burke did it. And the thing that drives me nuts about this case is the amount of people that assume things to be fact. Number one, John Andrew Ramsey, John's son, was in Atlanta during the crime. We don't know that to be a fact, and people seem to cling to these things as facts. They also seem to know the dynamics of the relationship between John and Fleet White. I see so many people that assume that Fleet White was thrown under the bus by the Ramseys, that he was urging John to do the right thing. Again, we don't know that at all, but we do know that Fleet, on several occasions, three to be precise, three known occasions, having outbursts, so much that it caught the attention of others. Pam Griffin attests to that, and the police were even called out in Atlanta. Fleet wasn't allowed to board the plane, nor stay with the Ramseys and John's family, and John's family felt the need to arm themselves from him. What is that about? This needs to be explained. Fleet hosted the party that night, and he was first called over in the morning. He was doing God knows what to the evidence in the basement, and even admits to touching things. He was the secret Santa which may or may not play a role in what happened. He supposedly made the 911 call on the 23rd, in which the police were dispatched to the Ramsey home and sent away by Susan Stein. Fleet had an outburst at St. John's Church, and Nancy Krebs came, comes out with detailed accounts of predatory behavior linked to Fleet White and his old man. I highly doubt this woman making, was making this stuff up. My point is Fleet White should be absolutely considered a suspect. He is all over this case, and it needs answers. In 26 years, the man has said nothing to help the case, and I'm sick of hearing about the excuse. He won't speak up because he doesn't want to jeopardize an ongoing case. That's BS. Because, since the jump, 26 years has the case has been denied, and justice has been denied by those in positions of power and multiple DAs. At some point, you would think a decent person with knowledge would come forward, and Fleet hasn't. He rarely does interviews, but he was the one on the Pat Boyle show, and he said there he, stood, he was there for about an hour and said nothing of substance, just hot air being blown around. And at the end of it, he hinted towards Burke being the perp and recommended reading Kolar's book, so he threw Burke under the bus and continued with the narrative that CBS put forward that Burke is responsible. And I don't think he is. I think that Burke is the latest red herring. Patsy was the first when the case broke. Oh, um, absolutely, Patsy was the first red herring when the case broke, and the reasons for this are, number one, she did not change her clothes or take her makeup off after the Christmas party, and they came home and that she stayed in her same clothes, wearing the same makeup, and also her similarities in handwriting to the ransom note. And the third one is a little bit less valuable, and that is that when Patsy Ramsey appeared on national television to talk about Jean Bonnet, she was under the influence of something, or overly medicated might even be a word. But let's just let's just get to the heart and soul of that problem. When she appeared on national television after Jean Bonnet had been murdered, she appeared very sleepy-eyed, and that bothered a lot of people. And there are also a few uh, linguistic elements in her uh, conversations and interrogations with the detectives. Number one, instead of saying that um, my husband didn't kill Jean Bonnet or her dad didn't kill Jean Bonnet, she said that she didn't do it. And when she talked about John Ramsey, she simply said, John Ramsey didn't do it. And it's just a very awkward way to refer to her own husband, not by any type of personal meaning, like my husband, my John Bonnet's father, not any type of familial connection. She calls him by his full name, John Ramsey didn't do it. And that really bothered a lot of people. But what's my favorite saying? Being weird is not a crime. Just because someone use somebody's full name instead of calling him my husband or the father. That doesn't mean that he was a murderer. 
And I do think John Ramsey, though, is a very suspicious character. But I would like to uh, keep going with this comment here. John and Fleet found the body together. Were they involved in what happened? Possibly. How about John calling his pilot immediately after finding his daughter and needing to rush down to Atlanta is very interesting. And if you watch the um, video version of Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, there's a big recreation of this where the Ramsey are saying, well, we want to fly to Atlanta right after Jean Bonnet is murdered. And the authorities are like, whoa, no, you can't leave. And even I thought, well... Yeah, of course they shouldn't leave. Their daughter was murdered. There's an ongoing investigation. I know you want to get away from it all, but that's just seemed very inappropriate. John Ramsey was saying that he had business to attend to Atlanta. He had business to attend to all of a sudden, even though they were going on vacation to Michigan. I think he needed to lawyer up his ex-wife, eldest son, and daughter, and fast. But why? In Linda Arndt's report, she was the first um, officer on site, she stated that John Andrew was on John's private plane from Atlanta to Minneapolis. Why was John's plane in Atlanta? Was John Andrew jetted out of Boulder late Christmas night or the early morning hours of the 26th? It only takes two to three hours from Boulder to Atlanta. And again, people assume that if John Andrew was jetted out, there would be a flight log. Two to three hours? That seems a little bit short from Boulder to Atlanta, to be honest, but that's just me. No, there wouldn't be, especially if a crime just went down and John Ramsey worked for a major defense contractor. We don't know the power or connections that he had at the airport or people in general. You know, I followed absolutely everything that you were saying, saying um, there, Jack Sizzle. But once you begin to say, well, John Ramsey could have manipulated some type of airport log or some type of info with the airports, I just do not... Um, know if you have the ability to say that like how would you be able to present that as a factual um statement but um the rest of your comment though i i do appreciate even if i don't agree with all of it i appreciate your skepticism and i appreciate you questioning other people's narratives now here's a comment from someone who thinks that burke ramsey is the guilty party i totally agree that burke did it accidentally and the parents covered it up his police interrogation at age 9 and at age 11 are very telling. The ransom letter is a joke, almost identical to Patsy's handwriting, but having lots of odd things about money and power gets you out of many situations. Also, Patsy would never hit or push her daughter. She was her life. The parents covered it up, and that is all to protect the other child and their reputations. Bedwetting is to be expected from a child under lots of pressure. And yes, John Bonet Ramsey was... Um, reported to have been a very heavy bedwetter, but that is uh, something a little bit different. Now, here is a, another comment from Joey Joe, who says that I absolutely believe that the theory involving Burke Ramsey is correct. Some of the details may be different from the actual reality, but it's the most plausible chain of events that I can come up with. I do think the toggle may have been made before the incident, and John in haste, haste recreated it getting Jean Bonnet's hair caught in it. And this is from the episode, Did Burke Ramsey Murder Jean Bonnet? And the theory that was uh, put forward and discussed in that one is actually shared by Tina L., the person whom I previously mentioned. And she stated that there's this fight over the pineapple right, and Burke stabs Jean Bonnet with the train track. But the additional element is that Burke tried to move Jean Bonnet's body by using a toggle rope or tying the rope around her neck and pulling her body because she's just absolutely unresponsive, so he thinks that she's dead, and unknowingly he ties the rope around her neck, and he's just trying to drag her body to another location because that's what kids do. They want to hide what happened, and from that point onward, um, Jean Bonnet was actually strangled, and then seeing what his son had done, John Ramsey is the person who altered the garrote, making it more complex, as a way to make it look like an intruder, the whole concept of we've already lost Jean Bonnet, we can't lose Burke too. And, I mean, the Joey Joe is in agreement with Tina in that particular theory. But at this point, I would like to turn it over to you. Out of all the things that you've heard in this episode, and of all these responses to different comments, which one stood out to you? Which one makes the most sense? Was it Burke Ramsey? Was it an intruder? Was it a pedophile? Was it someone else? And 
I want to be very clear about something. If you ever listen to any future episodes about the death of Jean Benet Ramsey, I've talked about how I absolutely more or less lean toward and think that an intruder murdered Jean Benet, but that it could include somebody such as Fleet White or somebody such as John Andrew Ramsey, because when I say intruder and it's coming from me, that just simply refers to Anyone who's not Burke Ramsey, John Ramsey, or Patsy Ramsey, someone who was outside of the nuclear family, and I mean, someone meaning that all of those people, whether it's Fleet White or John Andrew or Linda Hoffman Pugh, someone, oh, she's of course also outside of the nuclear family, but just anyone who should not have been in the house at the time or unknowingly entered the house, staged the scene, wrote the ransom note, and I'm curious what you guys think. Put your ideas in the comment section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there was always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.